In the last presentation, we looked at the old law. Today, we want to look at the new law, which is the second type of divine law that we will look at. So as I began the last presentation, we want to do a brief review on the law. We'll begin as we did the last time with the definition of law. A law is an ordinance of reason, meaning it's, uh, it derives from reason. It is reasonable. It is directed to the common good. Um, that is the common good of man living in community is formulated by a competent authority, meaning someone who is rightly in charge of the group, whether that be a governing body um, or uh, one individual, an elected official or uh, someone who rightly governs. And finally, it is promulgated, meaning it's uh, notified. It is communicated to the people so that they can indeed follow it. Right. Um, there are four types of law, the eternal law, that is God's design or plan for creation, how things are to be, to exist, and to function. There's the natural law, which is the intellectual creature's participation in the eternal law, meaning God not only has a design or a plan for creation and then executes that plan in creation, uh, intellectual beings like humans can recognize that plan and live according to it. Um, then there's human law. The human law is basically our application of the natural law to specific circumstances. Um, basically, we're talking about how do we take that something general like uh, do good and avoid evil and then apply that in specific ways, whether it be in family situations, family law, intellectual property, intellectual property law, uh, tax law, um, constitutional law, all the various types of law, human law, civil law that can come about um, living in community. And finally, the divine law, uh, that law which is revealed by God um, uh, for man. And that's precisely where we're talking about in the new law. So the old law was a part of the divine law, and now the new law as part of the divine law. So let's look a little bit more at divine law. As we've seen, the eternal law um, and the divine law are not the same thing. The eternal law pertains to the natural good of creation, the kind of general natural uh, plan or design that God has for creation. But the divine law specifically per pertains to man's supernatural good. Right? God made all of the things in creation, including man, and they have natural good um, uh, to which they are ordered, including man. But only man has a supernatural destiny. Only man in creation is destined for eternity with God, heaven, right? And in order to do that, in order to attain that, there's a divine law, a supernatural law that he must follow, right? Uh, man needs this law for four reasons. First of all, um, a supernatural good like heaven requires a supernatural law that we must follow, right? We need something more than just the natural law. Um, second, our judgment is rather uncertain, uh, we can and indeed fail. Indeed, because of original sin, we fail often in our judgment. And so therefore, uh, God needed to reveal a law uh, to us that we might be able to attain heaven. Third, uh, as body-soul composites and with our knowledge being primarily through the five senses, um, we are rather incompetent when it comes to judging purely spiritual things. We're rather good at judging physical things, and we even fail at that. But we are very incompetent at judging spiritual things, and so a divine law was necessary in order to aid us in judging spiritual matters. Uh, and finally, uh, the human law that we can create is simply inadequate uh, to forbid all evil. Remember, heaven is purity. Uh, in order to enter heaven, we must uh, forbid all evil and impurity in our lives. And so a human law is simply incapable of forbidding every. Um, every form or type of evil. And so a divine law was necessary in order to do that. The divine law comes to us in divine revelation, uh, specifically the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is where we get the old law and the new law. And as we saw in the last um, uh, presentation, the old law really corresponds to the Old Testament. And now we're looking at the new law. So what is the new law? The new law is really uh, the new covenant, that new covenant which is in the New Testament, as we heard last time, uh, testament, covenant, uh, sacramentum, uh, testamentum in Latin, um, are really just kind of terms that indicate a legal transaction. And so as we saw in the Old Testament, we had the, um, the, the Mosaic law, the law of Moses that was given at Mount Sinai on the way out of Egypt into the Promised Land. Uh, here we have the new covenant. Where, where does this new covenant take place? It takes place um, in, in Jerusalem, 
uh, with the sacrifice of Christ, uh, the institution of the Eucharist at Passover, Good Friday, wherein Christ is sacrificed on the cross. He is the sacrifice, and he's he, he's risen from the dead on Sunday. Um, this is the this is the new law, right? It's the um, it's the new covenant that has been um, uh, transacted between God and man. Uh, the priest of this covenant who performs the sacrifice is Christ. The animal which is sacrificed, the 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 sacrifice is Christ, the Lamb who is sacrificed, um, and He is reconciling us uh, to God the Father through this sacrifice. Um, and then, the, what about the uh, the precepts of the law? What what is prescribed? What is prohibited? We find this um, all throughout the New Testament. To be quite honest, in the teachings of Christ, in the letters of Paul, in the other uh, epistles that we that we read, uh, plenty of things that indicate how disciples should live. Um, but probably uh, the most idyllic uh, teaching for this is the Sermon. On the Mount, right? The Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus really is kind of the new Moses, um, laying out the law. Uh, so that's the Sermon on the Mount takes place in Matthew's uh, chapters five through seven, um, and it's wonderful teaching on the moral life there. Um, so, what does the new law do? Right? Very similar to the old law. The old law revealed man's vocation. The new law, the new covenant, through the sacrifice of Christ, man's vocation is restored. The image of God is restored to its luster, to its glory. Um, and so uh, we are saved, essentially, from that. The uh, interior law of charity. Not, the, the law is no longer written on tablets, right? Remember, the tablets were made of stone. The law is now written on our hearts. We have that, that image of law on the tablets. Law on the heart is picked up by Jeremiah, by Ezekiel. I will take out your hearts of stone and give you hearts of flesh. I will write my law upon your hearts, no longer on stone tablets. Those stone tablets, kind of the image of the stony hearts. Um, you knew the laws, but you didn't love me. Uh, but now I'm going to write the law on your heart, um, and you'll be able to follow the law. You will not follow the law. When the law is written on your heart, you don't follow the law out of fear. You follow the law out of love, all right, which is summed up in the great commandment, the love of God uh, and love of neighbor. And so now the new law is no longer external rules and regulations that seemingly take away our freedom. It's now an interior law of charity. It's this law that kind of comes out of us because it's been implanted within us. It's written on our heart. And so it's an interior law of charity, of, of living a life of love, love of God and love of neighbor. And more importantly, the old law never provided the strength and the grace to accomplish or to fulfill the law. Here, with the new law, Jesus Christ has merited us grace, divine help, strength through the Holy Spirit that we might accomplish the law. So no longer is the law just something that we have to try to follow and fail. This is where the old law is fulfilled. The old law is fulfilled in the new because now the new not only takes up the old law commandments, but it gives us the strength to fulfill them. Right? This is the grace of the Holy Spirit that is that strength to actually accomplish the law. Right? And that's why the old law is never done away with. It's, it's fulfilled. In fact, we see in the Sermon on the Mount, many of the things in the old law are not only repeated in the new law, they're actually intensified. Before, we were told not to murder. Now we're told not to even get angry. Before, we were told not to commit adultery. Now we're told not to even lust. Well, we couldn't even keep the old law. How are we going to keep the new law if the new law is more intense? It's because now the new law actually gives us the strength to accomplish it. The grace of God through the Holy Spirit. So, why is it the new law? Well, um, unlike um, the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament gave us promises. God promised many things in the Old Testament. Uh, he, uh, the promised land, which uh, Israel kind of lost twice. Um, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob kind of left the promised land, went down into Egypt, and then uh, Israel is brought back into the promised land, and then eventually the Babylonian captivity uh, and the exile. And so they were never. They came back eventually, but then they were still scattered. And so there's all these promises that have what we call. Um, eschatological meaning, meaning these promises of the promised land actually have a meaning of eternity, spending eternity with God, getting back to the Garden of Eden, so to speak, in creation. Well, the New Testament fulfills that. All those promises that are found in the Old Testament are fulfilled in the New because the Messiah has come 
and the end of times has begun. Right? Uh, not, not to mention uh, the commandments of the Old Testament, the commandments which we could never really fulfill because God never gave us the grace or we didn't have the grace in the old law. We now have that grace through Jesus Christ, through his sacrament, and through the uh, Holy Spirit who is given to us. Um, the new law is, um, is also summed up in, in some great teachings that we, that we know of. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? Um, that's such a simple, simple concept. And as we saw in the old law, um, St. Augustine says that the old law really just wrote, wrote on tablets, wrote on tables, what man couldn't read in his own heart, what was darkened in himself. But now the golden rule has not only been revealed, we've been strengthened to follow it. Um, and so the new law is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And finally, the evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Um, we typically think of the evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience, as uh, commitments which uh, religious monks and nuns have to make. Uh, all monks, all nuns, all brothers, all sisters have to make vows of poverty. They can't own anything. Chastity, they can't get married. And obedience, they have to be fully obedient to um, um, to the mother or the father of the house of, of their religious order. Well, to an extent, all are called to these evangelical councils. We're all called to obedience. We are disciples of Christ. We are called to obey Christ. Um, if you love me, you will do what I command. You will fulfill my commandment. You will do what I say. That's what Jesus says. And what does he do? He does nothing but fulfill the word of the Father. He does nothing but do the will of the Father. Jesus Christ is eternally obedient, and we're called to be just like Christ, obedient. We're also called to poverty. Uh, how do we know this? Because of the Beatitudes. Um, the, in, in the New Law and the New Testament, we have the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the clean of heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are those who are persecuted. So the idea of something like poverty, sure, we're not called to renounce everything. We're called to be detached from them. Um, and so we're called to give up, essentially, our attachment to this world, that we might attach ourselves to heavenly things, that we might reorient and focus ourselves upon Christ and upon God. Uh, and in doing so, chastity means that we um, we have a right relationship with ourselves. Um uh, in having a right relationship with our with ourselves, with our bodies, uh, with the temples that we're created to be for the Holy Spirit, um, we actually are are setting a right, setting anew what um, what what fell in original sin. With original sin, there was this um, there was this fall, and we were um, we were broken in our relationship with God, meaning we were disobedient. We were broken in our relationship with uh, other humans, and especially in the image of Adam and Eve with, with uh, husband and wife, uh, chastity. And then we were um, broken in our relationship with things of the world. We began to hoard things of the world. We began to um, acquire things of the world and actually look to things of the world to fulfill what we lost in God. And so we became gluttonous toward those things, and thus we are required now to be impoverished or poor in spirit. And so the evangelical councils call us to be detached from worldly goods, um, to have a right relationship with our bodies, to use our bodies in accord with, uh, with nature, and to be obedient to God ultimately, as we were always called to do. So how does this apply to our spiritual life? Uh, first of all, our vocation. Not only is it revealed, as in the old law, that we are sons and daughters of God because we are made in the image of God, now it's been restored. That image has been restored. And that doesn't just mean that we're, we're, we're perfectly fine thereafter. No, we have to live um, as images of God, all right? And we can re-mar the image of God within us by our sin, all right? And the grace and mercy of the sacrament of penance and reconciliation is there to restore once again the, the luster and the glory of the image of God within us. Uh, and we are called to always live as, as sons and daughters of God made in his image. Sin is forgiven, ultimately. All right? Sin is forgiven and death is conquered. All right? Though we experience death, death does not hold the last word. It is not an ultimate, um, it does not have ultimate say in our lives in that there is life after death. And that is, uh, that is where our focus is. 
That is where our orientation is. And finally, we have grace within us to act out of love. All right? God does not call us to do the impossible. God calls us to do what we think is impossible and then gives us the strength to do it. That is grace. All right? God will never test us beyond our abilities. He always tests us with the strength and the grace that he's given us to accomplish. And so we have that grace within us to act out of love in all things, to love God above all things, and to love our neighbors as ourselves and as God would have us love them.